Hey there, welcome to this episode of The Terry Cole Show. I am so excited to share this with you. I'm just actually start this one with a question. Are you sick of all the bad news that we are inundated with literally all the time? Do you ever watch the news and just go, wow, there's never anything but bad news? Well, this conversation that I'm about to share with you with Ione Butler, who is an actress and a voiceover um, performer in LA, although she's from London, is that she had the same exact experience and she just got really sick of nothing being uplifting. So she created a platform called Uplifting Content. And I think I found her on Instagram. That's how I found her work. But she also has this really beautiful, inspiring book called Uplifting Stories, True Tales to Inspire You to Take Action. And it's a book that not only tells you about other people's inspiring tales and the sort of the troubles they went through and got over and what came out of it. It also gives you ideas of ways that you can incorporate that some healing into your own life. So I hope that you enjoy my interview with Ione as much as I enjoyed interviewing her. Well, hello and welcome to the Terry Cole Show. I'm super stoked to welcome Ione Butler to the show. Welcome, Ione. Hello, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me, Terry. <laughs> Woohoo. All right, <laughs> so let's get started. What drew me to your work online was you pivoting towards really wanting some good news, like uplifting content, which is yes. basically your online platform. We need it so bad. And I'm always scouring the earth for people who are uh, doing uplifting things and sharing about it. And what I love about your platform is that you're collecting mm -hmm. all of these stories and it's the same thing in your wonderful book, Uplifting Stories, which you guys can get everywhere. Fine books are sold right now. It's called Uplifting Stories, True Tales to Inspire You to Take Action by Ione Butler. So tell me, like, how, how did you end up creating a platform about uplifting content? The simple answer is because I really needed it. <laughs> um, all my life, I've, I've sort of struggled on and off with depression. And I'm a, I'm a go-getter. I like to make things happen. And being depressed was so crippling and debilitating. And I hated feeling that way. You know, I've had my ups and downs over the years. And I just remember wanting to feel better, wanting to, to feel good, craving something that I could watch or listen to that would just lift me up. And so that was sort of the foundation of uplifting content in the platform. Um, at the time I started getting it going on Facebook, there was, you know, Facebook can be a real horrible place. And, you know, you go on there and you end up just even more depressed than when you started. And so the idea of the platform is a, a hub of inspiration. And it's gone through a journey. Originally, it was uh, let's, you know, start a production company. But at the time, I didn't have the resources or the know-how to do something like that. And then it became a, a place where people could share just lovely content, uplifting content. And then in 2017, Facebook changed their algorithms. And we'd had this like really lovely engagement on the page where I would do Facebook Lives for like an hour and just chat to people, see how everyone was going on. It was a really nice community. And then suddenly our reach was just like, ripped out from underneath us and it was like you have to pay to reach these people that you've already worked mm -hmm. to to get and so the i wanted to do something different and that was where the book came from as a as another avenue in which to get the message out there you know not everybody uses facebook um and the book is something that you know that some people enjoy yeah. so yeah the, it came from a need to just feel good and, and find good content right so your background is as an actress, a voiceover actress, a presenter. You, you, you actually are in, have been in the entertainment field for many years. And this has, is really, you know, you sort of call it your second passion. So yeah. how do you, are you still inspired by entertainment? I am. It's always something that is there. You'll, you, I'm sure you can relate. It can be exhausting just being in entertainment. Um, from a, as an actor, it's just heartbreaking when you don't get you're not getting the jobs that you want to get. And when I started uplifting content, it was in 2016, and I felt like I'd hit a wall with acting, and I wasn't quite getting to the places that I wanted to be getting in my career. And so I took some time off. I went traveling. I built the platform. I um, 
I built a lovely uh, retreat in Joshua Tree. I bought some land and built some yurts and have it as like a little oasis out there. Nice. Um, and I, <laughs> it's cute. Um, and I started all these little ventures. But what was funny was that this the pull for acting was always there. And in about 2018, I was like, I miss this. I love acting. I want to get back into it. So I did. And now I do it from a place of if I get the job, I get the job. If I don't, it doesn't matter because I have other ventures I have other ways of making money. It's not all or all or nothing anymore. Um, and it, that has really helped not feel so rejected when I don't get work because I have other things going on. I can afford to live and, and do other things like travel, which I enjoy. What's interesting about what you're saying energetically is that, you know, I would always say when I was a talent agent, you, you don't want to, if you want it bad, you get it bad you know, and we only want it good. And it's almost mm. like if clients would get super frustrated, I would always get into like visualization and it's just a numbers game and it's just a matter of time, like sort of just don't quit. But really what you're talking about is changing the way that you approach the situation so that it's so much more flow, so mm. much more joyful. And that, mm -hmm. hey, if it's meant to be and it lands, yay. And if it's not and it doesn't, that's also okay because you're passionately connected to what else you're doing, mm -hmm. which is amazing. And the fact that this platform came out of your own experience with depression. So let's talk a little bit about what did you discover different ways of dealing with depression? Because I know that you write and talk about this. Yeah, there's been many. Um, I, I kind of mentioned before that it was a journey when I was younger. I didn't quite know what was going on. So there was a long period of time when I was young where I didn't know why I felt so sad. Um, when I got to my late teens, early 20s, I remember trying antidepressants for the first time and realizing that I didn't like that. It made me feel numb inside. It also wasn't addressing the things that were causing me to feel depressed. Um, and then uh, in my mid-20s, I, I started a network marketing company and a big onus uh, of it was personal development. And they had this, they had a bunch of recommended reading books for reading um, about entrepreneurship, uh, like the power of now, which completely changed my thinking, which was a huge uh, difference. Um, how did relationships, uh, how to win friends and influence people, you know, how to get people to, how to relate to people and stuff. Um, I don't do the business anymore, but I would say that was the foundation. My, my personal development journey begin, began there. And so over the years, the things that I've done have, have come from reading those books. What I'm better at now is identifying when I'm feeling depressed or, or when something's going wrong. Because there was a time where I had no idea. I just felt sad and I didn't even understand why. And it's normal, normally... Um, career stuff, feeling like a failure that would trigger these um, dep depression, worrying about money, not having enough money, uh, feeling lonely when I was single, I'm never going to, no one's ever going to be with me. I'm going to die alone, all these horrible thoughts. Um, and then outside world stuff, which still is probably the main thing that, that, that kind of drags me down now, um, just dealing with the shape of the mm -hmm. state of the world and what's going on. So the first thing that I learned was how to identify when I was starting to feel that way and recognize I don't feel good, something's up. And then when that would happen, some of the things that I would do uh, now, some of the things that I do is definitely cutting out news. That's been a big thing for me because I, I find I struggle with that a lot. Um, and I, I talk a lot about, you know, we've heard that phrase, you are what you eat. M my phrase is sort of you are what you consume because it's it's more than just what you eat. It's what you're listening to. It's what you're watching. It's it's the products you're putting on your body that's, you know, getting into your system. Everything that we take in has an impact in some way. So when I'm starting to feel low, I do a little check-in of what, is, what am I consuming? Things that are upsetting me, I cut those out and I replace them with feel-good things. And so podcasts, books, audio books, uh, reading, uplifting stories, <laughs> cue the book, um, <laughs> and sort of... Um, uh, fill my, fill my conscious with feel good stuff. Now oh, look at it. There it is. <laughs> um, another thing would be to unplug. I find that when I'm depressed, especially if it's like a news cycle thing, I can get very compulsive, you know, on Twitter, reading articles. And so unplugging from devices, 
I find to be really helpful. And then if I if I am able to going out and being in nature uh, was one of the reasons that I love Joshua Tree so much. It just has a very calming, uh, peaceful quality to it. So that's kind of like my happy place I go to when it's not 110 degrees <laughs> um, being in nature. <laughs> one of the other things I found when I yeah. felt low was I was very isolated. You know, I, I dealt with a lot of loneliness when I was depressed and I would not want to reach out to people because I didn't feel worthy and that no one would want to hang out with me. And then obviously that would perpetuate the cycle because I'm not reaching out to anybody. So now I feel even more lonely. So that became really um, uh, destructive. And so now one of my things is to connect rather than retreat into myself, um, just to connect with people, even just to say, I'm feeling really low. I don't expect my friends to be therapists. You know, they try, but they're not. It's not their job. But just to, just to communicate, I'm feeling really low. I just want to be around you. We don't have to talk about it. Um, just want to be with you. That really helped. Um, and then things like yoga and meditation. But I call it like I go into this radical self-care mode where I'm like, I don't feel good. So let's do what we can to like ride this wave. Because I never feel like depression just goes away and you've cured, you're cured. It, we're always going to have these ups and downs and it's managing them that I've got better at doing. I think that what you're, you know, you're really talking about the ability to self-reflect, to slow down mm. enough to go, okay, let me look in, let mm. me see what's happening because I also stopped watching the news a really long time ago and like you I know that you read your news I know that you you control the way you consume information and that I think was probably a, one of the biggest game changers in my own um, psychological wellness yeah. is realizing that I could be informed I could vote I could protest I could do whatever I needed to do and still protect my most tender heart yes. from this deluge of bad news because it's not just the news, it's the over um, stimulation and the amount of visual and audio stimulation for me that I would be traumatized. I would literally be having intrusive memories, just flashes of things I'd seen on the news. And I'm like, I cannot give them, I cannot subscribe to having PTSD right. because I'm worried I'm going to miss something. I'm not going to miss it. I'm going to, I will read it so I can stop when it's too much. And, you know, I think that one thing that's so beautiful about your platform and about the book is that because negative news sells, which we know, mm -hmm. you are shining a light on the positive that is out there right now mm -hmm. and has always been. It reminds me of the way as human beings, we have negative bias yes. so that we remember the painful things five times more readily than the pleasurable things. And this was a, you know, a survival mm -hmm. mechanism. We understand it intellectually, but I feel like we need so much more of what you're doing in the world to counter, we need yes. five times more <laughs> mm -hmm. positive, you know, outlets. Mm -hmm. And they are there. It's just a matter of looking for them. And what I love about the book, let's talk about the book a little bit, if that's all right. Of course. I was reading through, and one of the stories I loved was about Phil Barb. And I'll, I'll ask you a little bit about Phil, but what I love about the way the book is laid out is that at the end of each chapter, it's a very accessible, consumable suggestion. Here's an exercise you can do. Mm -hmm. If you're feeling this way, you can do this. But it's for anyone. No matter how busy you are, you are not too busy for this wonderful book. You're really not. You're not too busy to take five minutes to write something down or whatever it is. So tell us if you would a little bit about Phil and you know, what about, what is his story and why did you choose him to be in the book? Cause I'm sure you had many to choose from. Yes. Uh, the book is interesting cause it, it's a mix of people who were friends of mine, people whose stories I knew, people who we researched to find them. 
or or people whose stories I had heard about, you know, for many years that just resonated with me. And Phil, from when we first met um, out in LA, he reached out actually because he was a fan of the uplifting content platform and he works in entertainment. We were both in LA and we just met as kindred spirits. He He's into coaching and he's also a TV producer. And just from the first day we met, he told me about his story, about being an addict, an alcoholic, um, his journey after his mother died when he was 16 and how he it was, you know, really bad and how the, the turning point and how he t- uh, turned his life around. It was basically his father was a um, a police officer. And there was one point where one of the new, he you know, got himself into a lot of trouble kind of was able to deal with it and then one time it was a a rookie cop that pulled him over once for drink driving and then that was it the guy didn't know who he was and uh that was that was the beginning of his healing and his recovery so he's like eternally grateful for that guy and so he talks about um his experience in Alcoholics Anonymous and um how that helped um and what he does now and the book is kind of split up into different chapters and his one is the overcoming adversity chapter and so like you were saying you don't have to read the book cover to cover whatever you're feeling you can kind of just find a story that's in that lane that you're in um there's stories about pursuing your passion and purpose so if you're feeling a little bit like what am i doing with my career or whatever or being of service you know if you if you want to give back and do more there's stories about remarkable people who who are helping others yeah there's that little exercise bit at the end and actually i do mention the negativity bias in there too because this this idea that we're the reason that we're pumped with um negative news is because people watch it they tune into it we pay attention to it because we're wired to pay attention to the things that could be threats i think it's important that once we understand that we have then the choice to not just be driven by our our subconscious we have the choice to actively seek this feel-good content um that that you mentioned too so yeah the uh, yeah the book the book makes me feel good (laughs) Yeah, me too. What I loved about Phil's story and where I guess maybe I felt personally identified is that he was a very high functioning alcoholic. And so you can go for a long time. And I come from a long line of high functioning alcoholics. Mm -hmm. um, And I stopped drinking when I was 21. And the thing, it's insidious in a different way Mm -hmm. because you're so friggin' capable that you can really mask it and hide it for a long time. And I understand Phil yeah. saying that he appreciates that rookie cop mm-hmm. who didn't let him off mm-hmm. because the guy didn't know his dad. Mm-hmm. And really it is those consequences that if we never get to hit the bottom, and, and also in, in Phil's story in the book, he talks about how when he finally started talking at AA, even though he was mandated, to AA, so it isn't like he was like, hmm, I can't wait. It was kind of like he was being forced, forced to go to, yeah. until he wasn't because he wanted to, that suddenly those frozen feelings about his mother's death when he was 16 mm-hmm. and just how painful it was to just watch her demise, he now started to have access to those feelings and was able to talk right. about those things. And of course, why why are we doing anything to ex to excess uh, we want to numb <laughs> yeah exactly our feelings that are really painful right yeah he was saying that that was the first time he'd ever communicated any of that and and another thing that i hadn't mentioned before my way of processing stuff well i kind of did mention it slightly you, you need to feel the feelings you can't just you know suppress everything that doesn't help you have to feel them acknowledge them and then they dissipate it gets easier and so yeah that was the first time in his life that he had shared and he was saying that it was hearing other people's stories and them having these revelations in AA really helped him to open up and so he talks a lot about you know being able to share your stuff as a way to give other people a chance to share their stuff you know being vulnerable allows other people to be vulnerable with you and share and listen so it is really beautiful his, his journey it's true and and in the rooms when when you've if you've had any experience anyone who's listening watching in in the rooms so you know going to aa na any of the 12 step programs a lot of the times you you're you're leaving it's like they, they always say you know take what you you know need take what works for you and mm-hmm. leave the rest and sometimes you're just grateful 
that that person's story isn't your own and that right. you, and it's not to wish it on them, but there's a certain amount of gratitude. I remember when I stopped drinking um, and I had a therapist who was like, hey, dude, you're an alcoholic, basically. And I was still in college and I was like, really? Because everyone Ooh. drinks like this. She's like, well, I don't care. I'm, I'm only seeing you, so I only care about what you're doing. And so she basically said, you have to go to a 12-step program or I will terminate working with you. And I was like, wow, wow. that's hardcore, man. Like, she's, mm -hmm. she's going to break up with me? Like, I didn't even know if she was allowed to do that. So I went to this, you know, church in Syosset, Long Island. And, um, you know, it was the 80s. So keep in mind, I was like smoking my Parliament 100s that are about this big, um, <laughs> sitting by the door. Because I didn't know crap about any anything. Nobody was yeah. talking about addiction in the same way that we are now. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know, like, what's the protocol in a place like this? Like, what do you do? So I was sitting by the door, really, I, I like to say it because I wanted to smoke my Parliament 100s considerately. I think it might have been more that I was hoping for a quick getaway if it turned out to be like a cult. But this woman comes over to me and she's like, oh, hey, you know, what brought you here, basically? And I was like, I just said, my, my therapist said I have to come to at least one 12 step meeting where she's going to break up with me. And she was like, oh, well, we're glad you're here and all this stuff. And I was feeling so like, oh, is she going to like mm. pull me into the middle or make me talk or I don't even know. And then just to be polite, because I didn't know what the, how, how to be in this, you know, I was 21 years old. I said, um, so what brings you here? And she just straight deadpan said to my face, I killed a six-year-old boy in a drunk driving accident. Oh, yeah. And I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And of course, that, that beautiful, generous soul who told me that horrible, painful story that she has to live every day mm -hmm. absolutely changed the trajectory of my life. I couldn't, mm. I could barely contain myself, got in my car, was hysterically crying, like, from relief. Because, you know, back then, a lot of people drove drunk, like yeah. all of us did, because everyone yeah. did. Like, it was just, we lived in the middle of nowhere, that's what people did. I'm not proud of that, but I did no longer did that after, I didn't, I never drank anymore. I mean, that that was the experience where I saw it so clearly, like, this is the could be the pivot moment in my life and I could so easily be this woman, but I'm not. And right. that was that's how I stopped drinking. And that that was the experience. So i I feel like um the generosity of communication and sharing that AA creates, I mean, listen, obviously we know it changes lives, but it really personally changed my life and Phil's mm -hmm. life, obviously. Mm -hmm. Wow. What an incredible I mean, gift that she, like, just saying that, oof, wow. Yeah, exactly. That's that's how I felt for, like, the next five years. Yeah. <laughs> like, I would think about it and be like, oh, my God, but it's not me. Right. I still have all these opportunities in front of me. I can still make a different choice. I still have choices of what I can do. Can I ask a quick question? Oh, good. How was it being sober through college? Sure. It was the end of college. So I was not even remotely sober during college. I was wasted most of college. But the last three months of college, I made that decision then. I was like, well, if I could not drink in my last three months of college, I cannot drink forever. Like, yeah. <laughs> because where else are you going to be as um, tempted yeah. to drink so much? It was really a weird trip, though, I have to say. It was this this wake up of like how wonderful can life be when you are fully awake and present Present, yeah right here right now you know agreed yeah wow oh congrats well thanks so <laughs> tell, tell me a little bit how you talk a little bit about meditation and mindfulness so how is this in your do you have a daily practice just tell us a little bit about how you keep yourself centered yeah the the practice has dropped off recently to be well, i say recently um it was always reading was the thing i 
think I was best at. I was reading in the morning and in the evening and that uh, for maybe about Mm -hmm. four or five years. And that was fantastic because I started my day in a good headspace. I would end my day in a good headspace. Um, And it really, it it, it was, it was just fantastic. I'm trying to get back into reading and I don't quite know why. Maybe I haven't found the books. You know, there's just certain books where you can't put them down. I've, um, I've, Mm -hmm. I've was using my Kindle now I'm getting like actual tangible books. I was like, maybe if I'm holding it, it will be different. Um, I used to listen to a lot of audiobooks. Mm-hmm. I don't drive as much anymore, but audiobooks would be the thing I'd listen to when I was driving. But reading was probably the biggest, I noticed the biggest difference when I did that. Um, and I go back to these things. I don't do them consistently, but I go back to these things when I need them. I'm also seeing a therapist every three weeks, which has been really nice. I hadn't seen a therapist for a long time. Thanks. Normally I would go to them when there was a problem, uh, when I was in a really bad way and like losing it. And then I would see them, but this is nice having somebody that I can just check in with every three weeks about stuff. So that's kind of my practice with meditation before COVID. There were some nice, um, places in LA. It's nice for me to go to a place because then I'm like gonna do it for the hour. (laughs) So that would really help. And then I've, I've used really nice apps like balance, which I is a, is a lovely meditation app. There's ones like calm and stuff like that. I actually have a, um, inside timer. Yeah. That's a lovely one too. I have a guided meditation uh, hypnosis that is online. I was taking a hypnotherapy course uh, at the beginning of 2020 and uh, because I do voiceover and I'm interested. So I thought, well, maybe this would be a good avenue to go down. And um, I recorded a a, a practice sort of hypnotherapy thing, made a video explaining the idea of it. And then I did it. And it's had like thousands and thousands of views on YouTube. And so that to me, I'm like, well, maybe I'll, yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm looking at doing some recorded affirmations and things like that to help guide people. I can't listen to myself. <laughs> I'm just distracted by my Same. own voice. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay, it's not just me. But other people seem to love it. Nope. So uh, I'm like, maybe I'll keep doing that. But I think one of the key things with meditation is uh, not getting yourself into an argument, not getting into an argument with yourself about not doing the meditation. And meditation can be in all sorts of different ways too. For me, one of the most beautiful experiences I had. I, so I built my yurts in the in Joshua Tree. I don't know if people know them, but they're sort of circular structures. And there's rafters. There's like a, a central ring at the top with the dome for the, for the roof. And then there's rafters that go all around. And I spent about maybe two hours uh, uh, screwing in these brackets to make sure all the rafters were secure against the ring. And it was the most meditative. I didn't think about anything else. I was just screwing in brackets and that was the nicest thing. So I think if there's a thing that you can find, it doesn't have to be sitting down uh, in silence, a thing that you can find where you're not thinking about every other thing. You can even do the washing up in, in, and meditate just by focusing on the act of washing up. Um, find something that you enjoy that just, you know, can take you away from the stresses of everything. Uh, it's great. Yes. Absolutely. All right. I have one last question for you that I ask all my guests. It's about Mm. boundaries. Mm. Personally, what has been your most challenging boundary struggle and how did you overcome it if you have? I think I'm pretty good with boundaries. Um, With other people, I'm, I'm, I don't, I, I'm okay with saying no. Uh, that's been, that's been pretty solid. I think with myself, I was listening to your episode about you having time off while you're away, uh, which I'm about to do. And so I was like, Oh, this is good. I'm glad I'm listening to this. I guess my biggest issue is me taking the time off and like, I work for myself. Um, I have a team that are based overseas. They normally come online at about 4 PM. So I'm working with them sometimes till like 10 o'clock because they're there. And so getting into the habit of having a time where the evening has started now, I don't need to work anymore. That's a boundary that uh, sometimes I I need to get a bit better at. I have mastered the art of the weekend, though, which I'm very proud of. (laughs) We don't work on the weekends. Yeah. And so um, and so that's really that's really nice. So I'd say my own boundaries in terms of my schedule and my time. Yeah, super duper common. Well, thank you, Ioni Butler. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we super appreciate it. Tell everyone where they can find you. I'm going to put all the, where you can get the book and all the information in the show notes, but tell us where we can find you. 
Yes, uh, I'm Ione Butler, I-O-N-E Butler on all social media. Um, and then it's Uplifting Content too. Um, the handle's Uplifting Content or Ione Butler. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out, say hi. If you want me to send you a meditation, I can do that. Um, yeah. Thank well, you thank for having you. me, Terry. Thank this you. has been lovely. Thank you. It has. I appreciate you.